Okay, so welcome back to the Person of Christ class. We've been spending a lot of time talking about what it means for Jesus to be God uh, and going over the fact that he's fully equal with the Father, um, that he is involved in creation and in the revelation of God in the Old Testament. Um, but today, <laughs> I finally want to get to the incarnation because it's just as important that he is fully man as well. We need to hold both of these truths together. And, you know, where else to start when we're talking about the incarnation than with John 1.14? Well, sorry, let me go ahead and mute, mute you there. Um, uh, Where else to start than John 1, 14? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John introduces us to the word, the logos of the Father, who is with the Father in the beginning, who creates the world, is the light and life of the world. And then we get to verse 14, and we have these words, the word became flesh. Now that's very familiar to you all, probably. You've heard this verse many times if you've been around the church. But I want you to, I want to just like defamiliarize it and like hear it maybe the way some of the first audience would have heard it. You know, let's imagine that you're Jewish in the, the uh, first century AD. What do you think of when you hear the word flesh? Um, well, we could look at, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls. We could also look at what the, what the rest of the word flesh means when it comes up in the New Testament. Often it has a negative connotation. It can actively refer to humanity's sinfulness, the sorts of lusts and sinful desires uh, that are in our flesh. And sometimes it doesn't refer to sinfulness per se, but uh, just refers to the frailty of our humanity in contrast with the power of God. Um, but usually uh, flesh is a contrast to God. It's the opposite. It, 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 especially this word flesh is a way of talking about our humanity that emphasizes its frailty and even its sin. So to hear the word became flesh must have uh, been uh, something very powerfully shocking and scandalous to the original listeners. Even more so if we turn over to the Greek world. Imagine that you have a kind of more Platonist view on reality. <clears throat> and you have this idea that our souls maybe pre-existed in this world where they could uh, commune with the gods and behold the uh, invisible intangible form of reality directly, but then they fell and became imprisoned in a body. <laughs> what would it mean to you to hear the word became flesh? This is really a groundbreaking <laughs> teaching uh, also for the ancient Greeks as well. Now, of course, just to clear up any possible misunderstandings, we don't mean that, you know, the word became sinful flesh. So that, that's one meaning that we wouldn't be applying to it. Nevertheless, this is a radical statement about how close Jesus came to us so much that he actually became one of us. And so it shouldn't be perhaps surprising, given how radical and shocking this is, that we run into a in the early church a number of heresies that all revolve around denying that Jesus really came in the flesh. Um, I've got a couple of words up here. One of them is, is docetism. This is the umbrella term from the Greek dokeo to, to think or seem. Docetism would describe any heresy that says it only seemed like Jesus was a human being, but that's just how he appeared to his disciples. He wasn't really. One particular form of docetism I want to mention is Corinthianism. And the reason I bring up Corinthianism is in a second, we're going to see a couple quotes from the gospel, from the letters of John. 
And according to church tradition, John actually was alive when the heretic Corinthus came along and had conflict with him. Maybe that tradition is true, maybe it isn't. But I think it gives it lets us put legs on what what exactly did this sort of error look like? Um, so here's here's what how Irenaeus describes Corinthus's view. He says, Corinthus, again, a man who was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians, taught that the world was not made by the primary God, but by a certain power far separated from him. And at a distance from that principality who is supreme over the universe and ignorant of him who is above all. He represented Jesus as having not been born of a virgin, but as being the son of Joseph and Mary, according to the ordinary course of human generation, while he nevertheless was more righteous, prudent, and wise than other men. Moreover, after his baptism, Christ descended upon him in the form of a dove from the supreme ruler, and that then he proclaimed the unknown father and performed miracles. But at last, Christ departed from Jesus, and that then Jesus suffered and rose again, while Christ remained impassable in as much as he was a spiritual being. Okay, I know there's a lot there. Uh, it's, it can, you, you, you would not believe some of the complicated systems of uh, uh, belief that, some of the, that existed in some of these heresies in the early church when you start researching it. But what are the main points here? Notice at, right at the beginning, Corinthus denies that God created the world. There's this idea of matter as sort of being wanting to keep God away from contact with it. So you don't have God create the world. You have, say, like a lesser deity actually do it. You separate God from matter in that way. And so if you feel like you need to separate God from matter, even in the creation, you can imagine what that's going to do to the incarnation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But how Corinthus goes around it about it is, is interesting. He doesn't deny that Jesus is a real human being, but he, he distinguishes Jesus and the Christ. The Christ is this uh, divine being, uh, God's the son of God, if you will, God's divine son. And Jesus, but Jesus is just a regular man, no virgin birth, but a very pious man. And in Jesus' baptism, the Christ becomes unified with Jesus um, and allows him to do his miracles and allows him to teach about the Father. But importantly, the Christ leaves Jesus uh, before he suffers and dies. Um, so Jesus in his death is, is, is depart, this, this being the Christ departs from him. Why? Well, you can see this concern for the Christ to remain impassable. Impassable means he doesn't suffer. God never suffers. This is a this is a true theological point that at, in being God, he is unable to suffer. But what uh, Corinthus thinks this means is that the divine this divine aspect of Jesus can't actually undergo the crucifixion. It has to leave, and so this is not really an incarnation, is it? <laughs> this is sort of just like the divine Christ coming to a certain earthly man and hanging out with him for a while. There is no becoming flesh here. Um, so I just bring this up as a particular example. Of course, lots of details could be different, but the general species of heresy we're talking about here denies a real incarnation denies that this son of God, this word, the logos, really becomes flesh. And so for the rest of the class, I want us to take us through some of the New Testament passages that address why do we need to claim that the word really became flesh? Why do we really need the humanity of Jesus to be real? And I want to start with the passages that may be even directed precisely against this heresy if we follow the church tradition that John is actually arguing against Corinthus in some of these passages. So, for instance, 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. <laughs> By this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses Jesus Christ 
having come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not from God. So notice that when you have a prophet come to you and saying, I have a prophetic spirit that's revealing something to me, you need to test whether they're legit or not. That's familiar from elsewhere in the New Testament, right? The problem of false prophecy. We have this problem. But John is very interested in a specific test. And that specific test um, is actually a sort of doctrinal formula. We can think of this as almost like a creedal statement in, uh, formulated against a certain error, just like the Council of Nicaea later. And that statement, which must be confessed in order to validate um, a, pro a prophet is that G Jesus Christ having come in the flesh. Um, you, sh you can't trust the spirit which says Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. So I hope you can already see that this must be addressed as some kind of error that denies that Jesus Christ really came in the flesh. Um, we find something similar in 2 John. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. There it is. That's the same phrase. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So we know from elsewhere in the New Testament that there can't, that there might, there, there might not just be one antichrist. There could be many antichrists, but specifically the form that antichrist takes in his day that John identifies in this letter is people who do not confess to Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Um, so you can see here how crucial this doctrine is, that it's kind of a basic test. And so it's no surprise that when we look at history, we find all these views like that of Corinthus um, that deny this. Another passage that might be directly addressed to this is in Luke. You know, there's this moment in Luke after the resurrection when Jesus' disciples see him and they're afraid of him. And the text says that they think that he is a spirit. But in, he has them look at him and touch him. And he says, look at my hands and my feet, for I am he. He's saying, I'm, I am Jesus, the Jesus you know. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Why might Luke have emphasized this episode in his gospel? Well, maybe because already at the time Luke was being written, there was at least the possibility of this misunderstanding that Jesus was just a spirit. Um, and he says, no, like he's, he's, he's definitely flesh and blood. It wasn't the resurrection appearances are not just the appearances of some kind of spirit or ghost to them. Jesus is raised in flesh and blood. We actually touched it. We actually saw it. So these are pretty good. I, I hope you'll agree text from the Bible proving that Jesus really came in the flesh. We don't have to really scramble for proof text here. But why is it important? Uh, I, want, I, I made a little list of passages that mention the importance of Jesus coming in the flesh. And we won't flesh out uh -huh, all of what these passages are saying because they address a number of different theological points. But I just want to kind of go through them and get a sense for how crucial this is for many other doctrines about the work of Christ. So the basic theme for this is that Jesus' humanity, his flesh, is necessary for his work. Um, we divide talking about Jesus into the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And this is one of the reasons why, because aspects of the person of Christ, including his true humanity, are fundamental to understand what he did. Um, his person is foundational for his work. So what are the sorts of things that Jesus needs to become flesh for? Well, the first one I have here is just manifestation. And what I mean by manifestation is that by becoming flesh, Jesus reveals God to us in a way that is uh, easier to understand, closer to us and our way of knowing things than any other previous revelation of God. So you see this already in John. We have, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he goes right on to, and we beheld his glory. So 
the word became flesh, so we beheld his glory. You see how the one is a necessary step in order to seeing the glory of the, the son. And of course, we could keep looking through John. He's, John emphasizes the point, nobody has ever seen God, but the only begotten God who's at the side of the father, he has made him known. Um, God is invisible, but in taking flesh, the son becomes visible. And so allows us in some sense to, to see God revealed in human form. This, there's a very brief version of this formula in 1 Timothy 3.16. He was manifested in the flesh. So this is sort of a very basic precondition. What happens with Jesus is supposed to reveal something about God and the fact that we can see and his disciples could even touch him is crucial to that manifesting of God. The next thing is necessary for is humbling or and we'll talk about this if I ever do a Sunday school class on the work of Christ, which hopefully I'll be able to do. We sometimes call this his humiliation. And if you hear, I'm thinking of Philippians 2. Think this among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider to be equal to God something to be grasped. So we, we talked about that part. We're talking about Jesus in the form of God. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and we could, in, I think, correctly interpret that he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. In other words, he, how did he empty himself? It was in this way. He took the form of a servant. Coming to be in the likeness of humans and found in form as a human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient un, until death, even death on a cross. Can God be humble? I think that's an interesting question. But I would suggest that the answer is, is, is no, at least not uh, as God. The nature of God is to be the greatest being, and it would be just sort of an inappropriate uh, thing to apply humility to him. Now, this passage does apply not hoarding or grasping his godness to the son as God. So we can say that God has a mindset of not hoarding or grasping his divinity. That, so there's something analogous to humility there. But the actual becoming humble, it seems to me from this passage, and even the actual emptying, the becoming empty, requires him to become human. Um, this is actually pretty important. Another misunderstanding we could have about the incarnation is that Jesus becomes less God. That, and that would be specifically an interpretation of the emptied here in Philippians. That emptying means that Jesus sort of, the son ceases to be God or becomes less fully God in the incarnation. We already talked about why that's wrong. The other passages saying that all the fullness of the deity dwell in him. But if that's not what emptied means, what can it mean? Well, I think it's this positive sense of emptiness, that being creaturely is to be sort of emptiness or like nothing compared to God. This is my dissertation topic. Lots of passages in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah 40 through 66, describe the reality of being human as sort of like a nothing or an emptiness when you compare it to the reality of God's being. So what does it mean for the God for the son of God to become empty. It means that he actually takes on this servant human nature, which is qualified as nothingness when it's compared to God. So um, we could go into that deeper, but I'll leave that there. Just say he had Christ has to become flesh, take on this human likeness, this human form in order to humble himself in this way. mediating so jesus is the only mediator between god and man to do that he has to be human we can see that from first timothy 2 5 for god is one and the mediator of god and humans is one the human jesus christ now this goes both ways of course i think we can say that jesus has to be god to be mediator as well he has to be both god and man his identity as god and man allows Jesus to be a mediator between God and man. But in this passage, what's specifically emphasized is the human Jesus Christ. Like he, he, because he is a human, he's able to act as a mediator with God. 
So it's necessary for him to be a mediator. It's a pretty important role for Jesus. It's necessary for his suffering and death. Here we can look at 1 Peter. Therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. And you should arm yourselves with the same attitude because the one who suffers in the flesh has stopped sin. So as to live his remaining time in the flesh, no longer for the desires of humans, but for the will of God. So Peter, as he often does, is making this connection between Christ's suffering um, and our suffering. And I won't get into that further, but I'll just point out that the phrase suffered in the flesh, Christ's su flesh is crucial to his suffering. Then we have Hebrews 2. Um, so since the children have participated in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also shared with them so that through death he might condemn the one having the power of death, that is the devil, and that he might set free those who were subject to the slavery of death through their whole life. Um, so, um, the author of Hebrews says that just that the children is us, we participate in flesh and blood. And so Christ, the son also likewise shared in them. Why, why did he need to share in the same flesh and blood we did? Well, at least in these first verses, it's so that he might condemn the one having the power of death through death. Let me unpack that a bit. The author of Hebrews has already mentioned Christ's suffering. Now he mentions his death. Um, Jesus can't suffer unless he shares in our flesh. Now, obviously, there's a bunch of other stuff that comes with that. If Jesus can't suffer and die, he can't condemn the devil in his death, which is something that he did in his crucifixion. Um, he can't set free those who are subject to the slavery of death by defeating death. So there's a whole bunch of other things, everything that we know the death of Christ meant, he can't do as well if he doesn't become human because they involve his suffering and his death. Finally, we can just mention this little snippet from 1 Peter 3.18, being put to death in the flesh, which again emphasizes the necessity of the flesh for the death of Christ. By the way, just as a side note, um, as theologians, we talk about God being impassable. I mentioned that word before, that he doesn't suffer. Of course, some more contemporary theologians, more modern theologians, don't like this idea that God doesn't suffer. They want to say that God can suffer too. So occasionally we're asked, is this really in the Bible? Or is this sort of like an import from Greek philosophy? And there are actually other places where we can show this from the Bible. But this is one good place Think what's the logic behind this, that the son has to become human in order to suffer. I think it's that as God, the son can't suffer. He needs to become human in order to do that. So there's an important logic here that the incarnation, the son taking on flesh is necessary for him to suffer. This is a theme that will come back later on in our refining precisely what this means. But for now, we'll, we'll move on. Acts as a high priest. Okay, I mean, it's the book of, in the book of Hebrews, one of Jesus' most, well, probably the most important role Jesus has is high priest. He talks about it a lot. And in the very next few verses from the ones we just saw in Hebrews, he says that it, the incarnation is necessary for that too. For clearly he was not concerned with angels, that is Jesus, but he was concerned with the seed of Abraham. For which reason he had to become like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things of God for the forgiveness of the sins of his people. For in that he has suffered, being tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, so he said that Jesus had to become human in order to suffer. <clears throat> but I mean, he might have become, you know, some other kind of animal in order to suffer, right? There's more to it than that. He's actually participating in our nature. And why does he need to participate in our nature? Because it's key to his representative function that he represents us as the high priest. And so he has to be one of us. What's more, in order to help us, he has to know our kind of suffering. He has to be tempted, but without sin, but still tempted in the same way as us so that he can help us when we are tempted. 
So this action of Christ as the high priest and the one who helps us in our temptations requires him, I guess you could say, to walk a mile in our shoes, which means that he has to ha share our human nature. Another way to put this, by the way, is that um, we've already said with the Council of Nicaea that the son is consubstantial with the father in his divinity. In other words, he's one substance, one nature with the father. But we have to say the same on the side of his humanity, that he is consubstantial with us, uh, not in the same sense that there's no distinction in uh, different beings, because of course, as human beings, we have a one human nature, but unlike God, we are divided into parts, into different humans, all those sorts of things. But it's still true that Christ shares the same nature that we do. Um, so we have that nice symmetry on his human side that we have with his divine uh, um, his uh, divine uh, um, existence as well. Um, access to God. So continuing the Hebrews theme, he, the author of Hebrews says, so brothers having confidence for entering. Uh, oh yeah, we, jump in. Uh, we have a question here. Yes, jump in. Jamie, would you quickly distinguish between uh, Jesus' role as high priest and mediator? How, how do you distinguish I think we're getting some some feedback there, but uh, uh, yeah, um, but high priest and mediator. Um, I don't think we can fully distinguish them, and this might be something we talk more if I do the class on the work of Christ. Um, there are a lot. A high priest is a mediator. It's one of his functions. He's actually not the only mediator, though. Um, prophets will mediate between God and the people, and then even kings. In some cases, you could think of it as that. Um, so. We could think of high priest as one of the most one of the most important mediating roles in the Old Testament between God and man. And so certain aspects of mediation are combined in that office. But Jesus combines even more. He combines all the mediatory aspect roles of the Old Testament, including prophet. Um, so I would say that priest is one aspect of Christ's work as mediator. And, you know, if we move on to work of Christ, one of the first things we'll tackle is prophet, priest, and king, and what those titles tell us about Jesus' function as mediator. Um, but mediator simply involves anything that involves being some kind of go-between um, his work of reconciliation. So these are not, these, these categories I'm giving you here are not necessarily hermetically sealed buckets. Several of these involve each other, and all of them kind of orbit around, especially Christ's death on the cross, his redeeming work. Um, so access to God, Hebrews 10. So brothers having confidence for entrance into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh. So this is a little comp a bit of a complicated image. Well, the author of Hebrews says that Jesus' flesh is like the curtain of the temple. Well, how can that be? The curtain, well, the curtain separates the people from the holy place. And in that sense, it sort of protects them from the glory of God consuming them. But I think there's more going in here because in the story of Jesus' crucifixion, we hear that the curtain of the temple is torn. And so we can think about, I think, I think how Jesus' flesh is pierced, torn, um, you know, and, and at, by, the, by the spear of the centurion in his death. And, and sort of in his flesh being torn, he creates this way of access into the holy place. Okay, so it's, it's a kind of a complicated image here that the author of Hebrews is using, but it's clear that this, what happens in his flesh on the cross is necessary for us to gain this new access to God, um, which is uh, the only point I want to make here. Next, also reconciliation. Uh, this is Colossians, and you were then alienated and enemies in your mind, in your evil works, but now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through his death to death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. So, I, I, you know, feel how physical this language is, how, how Paul is emphasizing the, that it's in Christ's body, the body of his flesh, that this reconciliation happens. You know, not that the divine nature is, is, is in unimportant, but here we're very focused on the human nature. Um, that it, this, why? Because we're talking about his death. 
And in his death, reconciliation is something that happens. And also we could say, you know, sanctification here, he moves right on to being holy and without blemish. Um, justification, Romans 8, for what was impossible by the law in the weakness through the flesh, God, having sent his own son in the likeness of the flesh of sin and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the right action of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walked not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Um, okay, this actually is a great example of what I was saying earlier. Um, at least three of the four times, I'll say three of the four times that flesh occurs in this passage, it refers to sinful flesh. So the flesh as our humanity, which in Adam has become corrupted. And, you know, Paul has just talked about being like this sense of like, I'm not able to do what I want to do. There's this law of sin at work in my body and in my mind, you know, even though my mind, I want to serve God, I can't. Um, the sense of the flesh as corrupted by sin. And it's in this context, and, and this makes it impossible for the law to bring this sort of righteousness. It's impossible. Why? Because of the flesh, because of what's going on with the flesh. So God sends his son in the likeness of the flesh of sin. Now, <laughs> this phrase has me meant that our systematic theologians have said, like, we need to be real careful here. Is Paul saying that, that Jesus becomes incarnate in sinful flesh? And, you know, some theologians have even wanted to say that, that, like, Jesus has this sort of, like, sinful flesh. And even though he doesn't sin, he has sinful flesh. We, we shouldn't say that, you know, elsewhere we, we hear that that he, he becomes incarnate without sin. I, I actually have a class where we may talk about this more scheduled. So if, if don't worry if, if you have questions, we'll come back to that. But of course, it, the word likeness, I think is key here in the likeness of the flesh of sin. Jesus comes in the same human image, which is the image which is corrupted in Adam, but in a non-sin corrupted way is how I would read that. Um, but never, why would Paul get so close to something that could be misinterpreted? That he has a good reason. It's emphasizing that in becoming in the likeness of this flesh, which is sold in sin, Jesus does something. He condemns sin in the flesh. He is able to, uh, in his flesh, carry out this sort of transaction that condemns the sin that we have. Um, in other words, it, they'd say this in, what we could call imputation based on other passages in, in Romans, that, that our sin is imputed to Christ. Um, key to it, as a presupposition of it, is that Christ comes in the same flesh, which in us is like riddled with sin. And that means that the incarnation is a key presupposition to the doctrine of justification. No incarnation, no justification. No Christ coming in our nature no imputation of sin possible. That, that's how I read this passage. That's, that, that's why Paul is using this, you know, this coming like just up to the edge of equating the sinfulness of our flesh with the flesh Christ takes. It is in some sense the same flesh, but without sin. And there's a mystery there. Again, I actually have scheduled a whole day for us to talk about that. Um, so uh, we, there, there'll be more to talk about. But here, I'm just making the point that incarnation is necessary for justification. That's the only point I want to make here. Okay, another theme that maybe is a little bit less obvious at first glance, but that I want to point out is what we might call a second Adam theme, which is the fact that, you know, Adam is the father of all humanity. He bears the image, and, you know, he not only bears the image of God, but the image of God is what it means to be human. And if you go and read um, Genesis, you'll see that Adam begets a son in his own likeness. So through the normal course of human generation, this likeness of what it means to be human that reflects God, although it's cor corrupted by sin, is passed down to the next generation. But according to the New Testament, Jesus comes as the second Adam. So not just another human being, but sort of an interruption of fundamentally what it means to be human. Like the human race is refounded with Jesus. Um, we could use the word new creation for this. 
Um, and so Jesus' resurrection is a new creation of humanity. So he's a second Adam. And just a couple examples where we see it. But the gracious gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of one, many dies, died, how much more will the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, be multiplied to the many? You can read the whole context. This, if what happened with the one, and he's talking about Adam here, what happened with Adam meant this, then what happens with Jesus, the, uh, the other, meant this. There's this kind of parallel comparing of here's what it meant in Adam and here's what it means in Jesus. Um, we find the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So again, you have this, this parallel and contrast as much as a comparison, right? This parallel between Adam and Jesus that in some way Jesus does again or recapitulates but in a perfect way adam's role and creates the human race anew in the process of it um so okay i don't really want to get into all the details of that theology it's a very important idea but um that it could kind of take us on another path i just want to point out that if jesus is not actually human this doesn't make any sense if he doesn't actually take our flesh so yet another important doctrine for which Christ's true humanity is necessary. Let me toss a little theological formula in here from Gregory of Nazianzus. Um, that which is not assumed is not healed. Gregory formulated this as a sort of formula against any view that would deny either the true humanity of Christ or any aspect of the true humanity of Christ. Um, because it could just be that we step away from Jesus. We could, we affirm Jesus humanity, but then we sort of step away from some part of it or aspect of it. And so Gregory has this formula that which is assumed is not healed. In other words, Jesus has to take our whole human nature and anything he does not take on is not healed by Christ. Um, and this is a summary of New Testament teaching for him. And it's a very helpful thing to keep in our minds. This is why it's so important that we affirm Christ's full humanity, his true humanity, is because since he heals our nature, if there's part of humanity he doesn't take on, let's say, for instance, a human mind or a human soul, which is something we'll come back to in a later class, then that part of who we are is not healed from sin by Christ. Another way we could say this is going back to that Hebrews passage, he had to become like his brothers in every respect. That in every respect is very important to underline, not just in some respects, but every respect. And by the way, I'll comment, you may have noticed the phrase likeness or like cropping up in some of these passages. And you can only imagine how that might have been misused by some of these docetists, right? Ah, you see? Paul, you know, Paul's in Philippians saying that he comes in human form or in the likeness of humans it means he's not really human. It's just like he's human. Um, but what's really going on? I think Hebrews clarifies it. He has become like his brothers in every respect, not in some respects. So this is not like, but not really. This is fully like um, an ambiguity, ambiguity in the way we use the word here. Uh, why do these other passages use likeness language? Probably because of the importance of image, the image of God, Adam passing on the image and likeness of humanity, not because they're trying to distance Christ from becoming really human. Hopefully all the other passages you've seen about the necessity of his flesh show that to you. But this passage is very important, um, like in every respect. There's again, a parallel to his deity here, that the, the son is like the father, the image of the father, the likeness of the father, but we cannot interpret that as if sort of like, but not completely. No, it, it, it's completely like. I wanted to throw something about the virgin birth in here as well. I'm, this isn't going to be a full class on the full significance of the virgin birth, but it does come up in this context. You may notice that Corinthus is apparently denied the virgin birth. Why might he have done that? Well, what's the symbolism of the virgin birth? Let's look at Matthew here. Uh, this is the angel that appears to Joseph. But when he had thought about this, look, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, 
Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for what has come to be in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So why do we believe the virgin birth? Well, I think some in the modern periods, the virgin birth has become kind of a paradigm case of God can do anything. And people who uh, deny the virgin birth have perhaps been seduced by the idea that God is bound by the laws of nature or that miracles aren't real or something like that. This is a legitimate aspect of the virgin birth. In Luke's account, the angel says nothing is impossible with God. So that's a very legitimate place to take the virgin birth. But at the end of the day, once we say, okay, we do believe God can do miracles, why did he do the virgin birth? Or, you know, what, why did he do this miracle? Um, and I think what we see here is this, it's a clear sign that while Jesus is human, he takes his humanity from Mary. Um, in not having an earthly father, it's a clear sign that he also has another origin. This language of the Holy Spirit bringing, you know, what has, what has come to be in her is from the Holy Spirit. Um, sort of this miraculous nature of his birth implies this heavenly origin. Um, but notice how troublesome this is for any view that just wants him to seem human or wants him like to, to be a separate being that comes to a human. Um, the, the logic of the virgin birth very much has uh, the, uh, this divine uh, person really taking on flesh, like being begotten in the womb of a virgin. And so the virgin birth has a particularly important place in Christology here. In, 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 in linking Jesus to humanity um, through Mary. The fact that Mary is a human involved in Jesus' birth, by the way, is just as important as the fact that no father is involved. The, um, that fact that he derives his humanity from her because it means that he is really human. The phrase, what has come to be, coming to be, becoming, entering this realm of flesh and becoming is, is very crucial to it as well. So I, I just wanted to do, do have a side note about there. There's why the virgin birth is important beyond just God can do miracles. It's actually important because um, of what it tells us about who Jesus is, both his divinity, but also his true humanity. All right, let me summarize up what we talked about today. Uh, first of all, the son is really and truly human. We say he's really and truly God, but we have to say he's really and truly human as well. Um, he needs to be fully human to suffer and die. He needs to be fully human to complete his redemptive work. He needs to be fully God and fully, and fully human to function as mediator between God and humanity. And the son's humanity is miraculously derived from his mother in the virgin birth. So these are all necessary truths, but they raise further questions. And the biggest one maybe at this point is how do Jesus's humanity and his divinity go together? Okay, we've got to the point where he must be really God and he must be really human. But how do we understand that? And there's a bunch of ways in which we could understand that that will be wrong. And so where we're going to be going next in the next few classes is getting into some of the controversy about how his humanity and his divinity relate. And in the context of that, we will be fleshing out further as, uh, what it means for him to be truly human. Uh, in, in, in more detail. But let me stop now and ask for questions about what we covered today. Anyone have a question? Well, I, I will ask one. Uh, I, as you were talking, I realized I felt a contradiction in my mind when I think of Jesus taking on flesh i thought well this is he took on the pre-fall flesh of adam that's why he was sinless mm -hmm. but then the pre-fall flesh of adam wouldn't have gotten the flu wouldn't have suffered mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yes that's kind of a conundrum <clears throat> yes and I, I i really this is why i scheduled a whole class later on to talk about 
what we might call the impeccability of Jesus, that he was without sin. Because it, it, it is harder than it might seem at first point. Because first of all, he took his humanity from Mary. Was Mary sinless? Uh, well, we don't think so as, Pro- as Protestants. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so he took human humanity from Mary, but took it without sin somehow. Um, but also he didn't, he still took it with various of these conditions of the fall, like the curse. It was still under the curse. Um, you know, I mean, Paul uses that language in Galatians, born of a woman, born under the law. Like he, you know, Jesus incarnation also includes his being born fully in the condition of this, having a history, being under the law, being in the world, being under the curse are all involved, even though he takes his humanity without sin. Um, and then like, we, we can talk things about like, yes, Adam's pre-fall humanity. Um, where is it? You know, is it in a box somewhere? Like, they, you know, we, these are ways of speaking, but you know, where is human nature if not in us? And didn't it become fallen and corrupted in us? Like, how can he take it without sin? That's a real mystery here. Um, and, and hopefully we'll talk about that more, but yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, he messed up his original plan. Why? Because, I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. Why can't he make Jesus have our flesh and for it to be sinless to get to, to combat what Satan did, you know, to overthrow what Satan did because he cares about us and he wants to fix it right. I and mean, he's God. It's like in the kids' episodes, you know, all those things they watch with Batman and Superman and all those. Why can't he fix it? You know, he could decide to do yeah. that. And, human flesh without sin to combat what Satan did, right? Oh, absolutely. All I'm saying is it, it's, it, it's a mystery for us, but nothing is impossible with God. That's what the angel tells Mary and, and even raising a man from the dead. So uh, you're, you're right along the right wavelength there that like, yes, it's a mystery, but that doesn't mean it's not true because God can, God can do things we can't understand. But aren't we supposed to look at God like that? I mean, and just- Oh, absolutely. Say, oh, absolutely i mean it's like well that's god and and like not to be surprised by it but to just be even more in awe of him that he did that and he did it for us 100 percent. other questions We got this down. <laughs> well, let me, okay, let me leave you with one last little story then, because I, I have a trouble not mentioning it every time I talk about the virgin birth. So John Calvin, in his discussion of the virgin birth, raises this scientific issue that was a conundrum at the time. And it was, when a child is conceived, is there only a male seed or is there a male and a female seed? Uh, and so there was this view of reproduction all the way to ancient times, which I think is, you know, is a little, little demeaning to the contribution of women, but that holds that there was only a male, there's only a male seed and that the woman's womb just kind of hosts it. Um, but then there's another theory and scientists argued about this, that there was a male seed and a female seed. Of course, we know from our high school biology classes now that of course there's a male seed and a seed and a female seed, the male gamete, female gamete. But John Calvin in the 16th century says, well, if there wasn't a female seed, um, it would be a little, di- you know, it, it would be a little weird to see how Jesus could take his humanity from Mary. I mean, God can still do a miracle for sure. But Calvin says, I think that because the, the uh, incarnation happened through the virgin birth, that means there's probably a female seed. And John Calvin was right. Um, <laughs> And it, I love it just because in the very complicated relationship of science and faith, which is probably more complicated than most people tell you, um, there's somebody just straight up using the Bible to get uh, a, a couple centuries ahead of science and be right. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> but that's just, that's the, I, lo- I just bring, love bringing that up every time I talk about the virgin birth and I'll leave you with that little anecdote. But let me go ahead and uh, close this in oh, prayer. And I will join you guys. I won't be there in person, but I'll be there virtually. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful mystery. We can't comprehend, but it is true, and you have done it, that you sent your son uh, taking uh, our human flesh, suffering and dying in our human flesh, and being raised from the dead in our human flesh to become the foundation of a new creation, which you are currently working in our hearts and minds, and which you will complete when you raise us from the dead. What a wonderful, mind-boggling, hope-giving truth this is. We pray that you'd help us to uh, hold on fast to that hope this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.